My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human. Like if you asked someone to draw a person, but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long, and frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful typical, boring, old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening, planting flowers, when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. 
I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenald Lushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate. So the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. 
It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks and since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. 
Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it, because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually, we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old-looking, smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs her smiling face undulating from the shadows. This happened about 20 years ago when I was 16, but I remember it like it just happened because it freaked me out so badly. I've never seen anything like it before, and I wouldn't have believed it if somebody had told me the story. But I witnessed it myself, and I have never been able to find a logical explanation. I was a huge boring nerd, and I still am. So I was lying in bed reading The Complete Idiot's Guide to Learning Latin. You can look it up online to see how it looks. Big orange and white book with black print, like textbook sized. I heard my mom call to me from the living room, so I sat up and glanced around for something to use as a bookmark, 
since I was always very careful with my books and refused to dog-ear the pages. I didn't see anything handy, and my mom called for me again. So I knelt down next to my bed and carefully tented the book on the floor at a steep angle so the spine wouldn't take damage. Then I opened my door and walked out. Our house was a three-bedroom, but not very big. When I walked out of my room, I turned left and went down the hallway past my brother's bedroom door, which was closed. He had a habit of pacing his room while he talked on the cordless phone, and I could hear him doing just that as I walked by. At the end of the hallway, I turned to look into the living room, but I didn't leave the hall. My mom was sitting on the couch with her boyfriend, and she looked over and asked if I knew where the remote was. I said I didn't, and she said, okay, so I walked back to my room. I was gone maybe 45 seconds at the max. I walked in, closed the door, and turned to walk over and pick up my Latin book, but there was nothing there. It was gone. It was so unexpected and impossible that I just froze. It was like my brain couldn't come up with any possible actions to take in this situation, so I just stood there staring blankly. There were only four people in the house, one of which was me. My brother never left his room during those 45 seconds. I'd have heard his bedroom door open, and I'd have heard him stop talking. He has a very deep, rumbly voice. My mom and her boyfriend were getting ready to watch a movie in the living room. Even if one of them had tried to pull a weird, random prank by taking my book, they wouldn't have had time to pull it off unless they'd literally been running, which I would have seen and heard. And it's not like anyone could have broken in and taken it. The previous owners had been burglarized once, so they had a burglar bar installed on all the windows and doors. Our joking nickname for the house was Fort Knox. Besides, what thief would come in and steal a Latin book? All this was running through my mind while I stood there staring. After a few minutes, I decided my mind must be playing tricks on me. I know the human brain can ignore information right in front of it if it decides it isn't important for some reason, which is how we can miss seeing something in plain view. I was amazed to have an awareness of the phenomenon in real time, and I marveled over how strange the brain is. I started to slowly approach the spot on the floor while staring at it, wanting to see the moment when the book would appear to materialize there as my mind stopped being stupid. But it didn't happen. I thought, all right, well, my eyes are playing tricks on me, but my hands won't. And I crouched down and swept my hands across that spot on the floor where the book should be. I felt nothing, just the carpet. I was totally shocked because my mind is playing tricks was the only reasonable explanation that I'd had. And now, that was out. Had I completely imagined the crystal clear memory of tenting the book on the floor? After a few more moments of staring and rubbing my hands all over the floor, I decided that was the only other possible explanation. I must have actually put the book somewhere else. I got up and proceeded to tear my room apart. I pulled blankets and pillows off the bed, combed through both of my bookshelves, opened desk drawers and dresser drawers, shook out clothing, even opened my closet and practically turned it inside out. Every few seconds I would stare back at that spot on the floor, but it was empty. After close to an hour of searching, I finally laid down to peer underneath my dresser. Nothing. Then I sat up, shaking my head in defeat. There was nowhere left to look. I glanced back one more time at the spot on the floor. The book was there, exactly where I thought it had been, tented just how I had left it. I froze up again, breathless, feeling like I had just been electrocuted. How the... After I unfroze, I gingerly picked it up and looked at the page it was open to. Same page that I'd been on when I put it down. It was as though the past hour had never happened, except that now my room was trashed. Where in the world did my book go? And how did it come back?
When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint, and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly, and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him. So we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch The Breakfast Club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me, but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kid's room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities, some good, some not. 
The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. It's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. My boyfriend passed at the end of March, and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant, and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet, because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts in the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory, anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. 
the other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot well out of sight of the group on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. 
I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks and none of them went missing. And then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back. Only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I, I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it, I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire and at the stack of blue five gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag a possible's bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge, 
is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered, we were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, 
and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold, like really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks, and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. And that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. 
He thought he was still asleep at that point, and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. So I'll preface this by saying that I've had some pretty insane experiences. This is one of the tamer ones, but it's recurring and it's always the same. I've lived in four different states in my life, grew up in Indiana, went to college in Kentucky, lived for four months in New Jersey, and I currently live in Missouri. In that time, I have lived in, give or take, 20 different houses, apartments, and dorms. I've also worked in many different places. This black shadow person has shown up in almost every single one of them. I say it's a shadow, but he's really just kind of a big black mass that definitely looks three-dimensional and kind of fizzles out at the edges. That's the best I can explain it. He usually disappears within four or five seconds of me seeing him, and I always check to make sure that it wasn't my own shadow. The first time I remember seeing him was at the house that I was born in, right before we moved. He was standing in the garage, then quickly disappeared. After that, I would see him in my doorway when I was playing video games. I would see him at school down the hallways, one of the more memorable times was when I was at work, and I saw a black figure walk up to the register to my right. I thought a coworker had come in to start his shift. I said, hello, and my boss was standing next to me and said, who the hell are you talking to? I replied that my coworker had just walked in, and my boss said, um, no, no one else is here. He showed up the night my parents told my brother and I that they were getting a divorce. He was sitting between them, on the couch, which I thought was odd. He showed up the day before the worst medical emergency of my life. I was flipping through the mail at my mom's new house, and I could see a black figure peeking around the corner, about ten feet from me. I looked up, and it was gone. I looked back down, and it was back again. This happened three times. On the fourth time, I looked up long enough to see the hands wrapped around the corner of the wall and the full head and shoulders before it ducked back behind the corner. The very next day I had a migraine that presented itself as a stroke at the age of 18. He showed up the day I left for college. He was standing beside my car. He showed up in my dorm room right before I walked out into the hallway to see my stalker standing there, smiling at me. She was real, and I'm still not sure how she found my dorm room on the 16th floor or how she got in. We had to be swiped in or swiped out with someone who lives there as their guest, but 
that's a whole other story. My girlfriend saw him once right after we had moved into our new apartment. He was standing in the doorway to our bedroom while we were watching TV. She hadn't believed me when I told her all the stories of him just appearing out of nowhere at major times in my life. She saw him that time and believes me now. I've seen him five or six times in the last five months. I saw him on the morning my grandmother died and at her funeral. He was standing next to my father. I saw him at my college graduation party, standing in the corner. The closest I've ever seen him was when I got my new job and was sitting at my desk for the first time. I looked up from setting up my new work laptop and he was sitting in one of the chairs immediately in front of my desk. This is the first time he didn't immediately disappear. I could see him for about 30 seconds and I felt this feeling of approval radiating to me. It was like he wanted me to know he was proud. My girlfriend believes that it's the ghost of the miscarriage my mom had the year before I was born. The black shadow has always been close to my size, if not slightly bigger. She thinks that he's trying to be my big brother and warn me of bad things that might happen, or to be there to support me during major life accomplishments. I tend to believe that because it sounds better than anything else. The reason I'm telling this story is that I had an incident recently with what I thought was my shadow friend. I was on a fire scene, drawing up a diagram in this old rundown building that was being renovated into apartments in a small town in southeastern Missouri, literally about 40 feet from the Mississippi. I'm standing in this room that's being remodeled when I see him in front of me, in another room. There's no drywall on any of the walls yet, so I can see the entire area. I stop and look at him, and nod my head. When he disappears, a bucket comes flying off a workbench in front of me, and lands a good seven to eight feet from where it was sitting, about two feet in front of me. I'm scared out of my mind at this point, and I go back into the area of the building that had already been finished and was where the fire had occurred. I'm waiting for the lead investigator to get back to the scene when I hear footsteps coming up the stairs behind me, followed by the very distinctive sound of boot steps on wet insulation. I called out to the investigator with no response. The boot steps continued very slowly until they reached the doorway, but nobody was there. I get chills just thinking about this. What concerns me is that I saw my shadow friend immediately before all of this, but he's never made a sound or moved anything before. I've also never felt fear around him, only comfort or confusion. I also haven't seen him since. I have no idea what the hell happened. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay, 
and was keeping me safe. This is going to be pretty short, but I'm going to get straight to the point. I've been seeing shadow people for the last few months. They're not all the same, though. I don't know if it's normal, but I see them in groups of one to three. I'm interested to know if it's coincidence that I keep seeing them, or if there's some reason for it. I have met a man with no face before, but I'm not sure if that might have anything to do with it. I'm not making this up, I just want some answers. I don't know why I keep seeing these things, why they show up in groups, and why they're slightly different every time. What do you think? I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal but it's really hard to tell what happened. I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. 
she bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry, I couldn't scream, I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house 
that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff. Like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual. But I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in. But I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by, and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down, and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And, true to his word, we never went back in there again. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around 9 o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9pm at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. 
Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her, because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister, home alone. One day we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. 
I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace when my sister said, what, from right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room and she said no. I told my sister what happened and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom, and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me, and one time, I heard a whisper that said, come play. I prayed a lot and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down and that helped as well. One time my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs 
and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there, and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night, and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house. A boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom, where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery for the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm. Not hard, but firm. And he whispered, What the hell? While looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. 
I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved, and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't tell but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it, though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious. That if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we, somehow, just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. 
My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it, he finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. It was the summer of 2010 and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint, and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed, and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me, and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me, I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage, 
He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination, or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines. Headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake and that it was his people's land and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather and as I walk away, he shouts, they don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect, and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously, and I wanted to share my experience. Last Thursday, in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence.
So I always thought this was strange. I even told people about it, but chalked it up to people working overnight or something. But now, I'm not so sure. I worked for one of the biggest tech companies for about 10 years. I traveled a lot and sometimes taught workshops. I remember visiting Puerto Rico to deliver a workshop. I was really impressed with the people in the office. They were serving lunch on silver dishes and had a really classy atmosphere. It was a company location, so there were no customers in the office. One strange thing that happened, but not necessarily weird, was after eating lunch with the students, I'd started teaching again. And little by little, the office people would just casually walk in, right past the projector and me lecturing and grab lunch. I wasn't mad, I actually found it kind of funny. Besides, the staff had some good looking and generally nice people, so there's that too. The strange part was that I remember after one class cleaning up for the night and visiting the bathroom before leaving, and I noticed that it was a bit aged. Maybe leaking faucets and water stains, nothing gross, but it was definitely an old bathroom. There were several stalls and urinals. Now, I left likely at around five o'clock and the office was closing down. The next day when I visited that bathroom, it was completely different and looked brand spanking new. I'm talking marble, tile, everything looked like it had literally been done overnight. I remember mentioning this and really getting no response from anybody. That night was when the oil refinery blew up. I booked my flight a day early and got out. I was afraid that it was either an attack or the smoke would force the airport to be closed down, which would cause havoc with me trying to get home. I never did figure out what was going on there with that bathroom or with the people. Looking back on it, maybe they weren't real either. Or maybe it was some kind of glitch. I've mentioned this a few times to people over the years as a funny story, thinking that they had actually remodeled this bathroom overnight. But now that I think of it, there's no possible way that they did that. I was leaving when the office was getting ready to close. There were no signs, no workers coming in, and no recollection of the employees the next day. Plus, this work wasn't just a makeover. Like I said, it was granite counters, tile walls, the works. It was just very strange. So I work with kids and one of them comes up to me and he asks me if I have ears. I'm thinking that's kind of an odd question, but I say, yes, I do have ears. He goes, if you have ears, then why can't you hear the people asking me to play with them? I stare at this kid in shock as he walks away. I was like, what do you mean? But he never answered me. That really freaked me out because all the other teachers that I worked with there were convinced that the building was haunted. Up until that point, I didn't believe them. But after that, I don't know. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of the house and out of town, and I rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had lots of time on her hands, and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying. The woman, who literally had no life besides trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing a lot of weird things. I would wake up and find her watching me sleep. She stole my sunglasses, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and trolling me in real life. However, she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch despite my interest in spirituality and tarot, I actually don't believe in witches or witchcraft, but nonetheless, she claimed to be one. 
I think the spells work on a belief system that causes a domino effect of either positive or negative things occurring. Either way, no matter. I decided I had had enough of tolerating her BS and I moved out. That resulted in her stalking me. She turned up twice to my workplaces, staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police. Then she tried to cyber stalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. Eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. But again, whenever I tried to get up or turn the light on, it would vanish. One night, I woke up to it standing there like usual, but I could see a creepy woman's face on it. It was smiling at me. I told it to F off and it vanished. For a while, I didn't see the thing, but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they were coming from. I would find them on my arms, my chest, my hips, my thighs. One night I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something had bit me. Instead, I found scratches on my shoulder and back like somebody had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me, and I even visited a doctor who just accused me of self-harm. I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out where these scratches were coming from. The last incident occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over onto my side. I felt air on my face. I originally ignored it, until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet, like someone had killed her and then left her in water to rot. Her body was coming out from underneath the bed, while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed, and I was too scared to get off the bed. So, like a little kid, I covered my face with a blanket, and I started saying prayers and waited until morning. After that, it never came back, and all the scratches healed. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time, and was somehow scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I don't believe in spells and whatever, but whatever it was wanted to pose as a female, and I think it was part of my loser ex-housemate's nonsense, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something she had sent after me. I don't really know what it was, but I haven't seen it in a long time, so... As long as it stays that way, I guess it's all good. This wasn't anything mind-blowing, but it happened to me earlier today, and it made me so confused. I live in an apartment building, and the ground level is like a communal public space. I was taking the lift down from my apartment level to this ground level to exit the place in the morning. The lift doors have transparent panels, so you can look out of the lift. And because of how lifts usually slow down when they're reaching the destination floor, and the doors sometimes take a few seconds to open, I had a good 10 seconds to look at what was happening at the public space in the ground floor. From what I saw, there were three men mopping the floor, and one old lady, who I know is my neighbor, was walking across the space in front of these three men. But when I was in the lift, I noticed that all four of them were frozen. But it was weird, because they weren't just standing in casual positions. The men looked like they had just frozen as they were mopping, and the old lady was literally mid-stride. I spent a good three or four seconds wondering what was going on as I waited for the lift doors to open. But the moment the lift doors opened and I stepped out, everyone started moving. The men went back to mopping the floor, and the lady continued walking again. It was so odd, though, because it literally looked as though somebody had pressed play on them when I stepped out of the lift. It was so weird to me. 
I have no idea what happened. Years ago, I was living outside of Buffalo, New York, on an old estate on the Lake Erie shore. I rented the carriage house of an old mansion that a doctor and his wife owned. The doctor was a heart surgeon, and they were a well-to-do couple with multiple properties, so they weren't around that often. I liked the solitude of the place, having just gotten divorced, and although the carriage house was slightly decrepit, I loved living there. The mansion overlooked the lake, and my house was closer to the road, off of a private drive that went from one side of the estate to the other. The carriage house had been a servant's quarters for whoever lived in the mansion at the turn of the 20th century. There was an enclosed courtyard outside my door that was bordered by the back of my house, the carriage barn, which had stored carriages back in the horse and buggy days, a row of empty horse stalls, and a brick wall with an entrance to the courtyard. It was a very cool place to live, the rent was cheap, and there was a private 150-foot-long beach that was hardly ever used by anybody but me. But it was very isolated if there was nobody staying in the mansion, and there weren't any close neighbors because all of the houses along the road were big estates, and a lot of the rich people living in the area weren't full-time residents. But I was young and brave, and it was a big estate full of decaying spookiness and I'm a weirdo that likes that kind of stuff. So I was overjoyed to find the place. One night, I was coming home late, around 1 a.m. from a friend's house. Driving down a street a mile or two from my house, I saw a dark figure up ahead, standing close to the road. I thought that was kind of odd, because it was late at night on a weekday, not exactly party time in the Buffalo South Towns. I started to get a little nervous because the person was standing as if they were waiting for someone to pick them up. As I got closer, I could see they were wearing an unusual black shroud-like thing, long and dark and draped with part of it wrapped over the person's head to look like a hood. It was similar to someone wearing an abaya or a hijab, only much looser, like a bunch of material just wrapped around somebody's body. It seemed totally inappropriate for what I knew of the people that lived around the area. Nobody ever wore anything like that, and certainly not outside at one o'clock in the morning on a weekday. The person was just standing by the side of the road, looking stooped over and old. I slowed down to a crawl as I approached, worried that the person needed help. Maybe it was an older senile person that had walked out of their house in the middle of the night, confused. When I got close enough to really see the person, she lifted her head and looked my way. And I saw that it was my ex-mother-in-law. I was absolutely, positively sure that it was her. The same gray-brown hair, the same eyes, the same enigmatic smile that had always made me wonder what she was thinking about but never saying. She raised her hand and waved at me. Not a stop and help me wave, but more of a, gosh, it's good to see you wave. That scared the hell out of me because my mother-in-law had died three years previous to when I was driving down that road. I sped up and kept driving, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But a few minutes later and a few deep breaths later, I told myself I should go back and take another look. My mother-in-law had loved me I couldn't imagine her ghost would appear seeking revenge on me for divorcing her son, who had not treated me well, to say the least. I drove in a square by making left turns and went down the same road again, but there was no one there. I was too freaked out to go back to my spooky carriage house with the weird sounds and hundred-year-old history, with nobody there but me and the ghosts I was convinced probably inhabited the place. So I drove to the local all-night Greek diner and sat there for an hour, drinking coffee and calming my nerves. When I finally drove home and into the courtyard, 
I could see that something was wrong. My door was standing open. The glass windows were broken. The door was cracked almost all the way through from one side to the other. Someone had destroyed the door to get into that house. The next day, I found a crowbar in the courtyard, thrown off to the side. The only things I noticed missing from the house were just a few pieces of my clothing, super creepy, a jar of loose change, and a knife from the kitchen. I was just divorced and not exactly rich. I didn't have much worth stealing. It's very scary when someone breaks into the house you live in, all by yourself in an isolated spot. They must have driven right into the courtyard and would have been hidden from view while they broke down the door. I called the cops. They never caught anyone. With all the upset of the break-in, it wasn't until hours later that I remembered having seen my dead mother-in-law waving at me from the side of the road, dressed like the Grim Reaper. I'm convinced that she somehow appeared to delay me from going home, that if I had driven straight to the carriage house, whoever the person or persons were who had broken my solid wood hundred-year-old door practically in half with a crowbar might have been waiting there for me or I could have surprised them, and that things might have turned out very differently for me. My name is Luna, and I'm 35 years old, and I'm a hospice nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for the last 10 years. This is a story about a young woman I took care of that I became very close to. The patient in question was 23 years old and was dying of liver cancer. She was given about six months when she was told she was terminal and was put on hospice. I started going to her house twice a week at first and we really liked each other. As she started slowly going downhill, I started coming more and more until I was there every day. Most of the time, we would just sit and talk. She was a very pretty girl with long black hair and blue eyes. She was very athletic and active before she got cancer, so not being able to do things for herself or get up and around without help was very hard for her. She always wore a minty smelling perfume, which I liked very much. I was with her the day she died, and that was a very hard day for me. I got home pretty late that day, and I made dinner for myself, and sat down in the living room in front of the television. I had been sitting there for about five minutes, when I smelled a minty smell that was just like my patient's perfume. Then I heard a cough, and a female voice call my name. I looked over toward the kitchen and there was my patient standing beside the kitchen counter. She just looked at me and she was smiling and then she waved and disappeared. I think it was just her way of saying she was okay. Sometimes to this day, I still feel like she's watching over me. Sometimes I still smell her perfume, especially if I've had a hard day. This happened last year when my grandmom was admitted to the hospital and I was visiting her. The hospital was an hour's drive from my cousin's place. At about 11.30 p.m., my uncle and I left the hospital to go back to my cousin's place. A little context. This was in Jammu and Kashmir, India. The main city, Jammu, is connected with other smaller towns via a main highway so we had to use that to get anywhere. We were about a 20 minute drive away from home when we see this woman standing along the edge of the highway, hair tied back cleanly and wearing the traditional red sari or wedding dress with blood flowing along her arm. My uncle, with an intention to help, started to slow down until I alarmed him because I saw her bare feet which were reversed. 
We sped past her, all the while chanting Hindu chants, because we're a very religious family. As we got home, we had a strong fever that was gone by the following morning. We asked around, and we were told that there was this girl who lived near the highway, who had slit her wrists on her wedding day a month ago because she was being forced into marrying this guy she didn't want to marry. Many people see her and crash their vehicles in confusion. I still remember her, clear as day. I'm getting chills even writing about it. Last October, my best friend, Tanner, died unexpectedly. I don't need to go into too many details because they're not relevant to the story, but it was easily one of the hardest hitting losses I've ever experienced. He and I shared a very close and special bond and had overcome a lot of life together. He had moved in with our mutual friend, Beth, and her boyfriend several months prior to passing away so I would constantly come over to hang out with everyone as I lived nearby. One summer day, we all had a giant Nerf gun fight together in their front yard. I distinctly remember making eye contact with Tanner and having this strange gut feeling at the time that this was going to be a bittersweet moment. But I brushed it off as just being sad that summer was coming to a close. I felt uneasy that he had at the same time a sad, longing look in his eyes that I did. It began to get dark out. After collecting as many darts as we could, we headed inside, and Tanner declared, this isn't over yet. A month later, after noticing many strange behaviors, Beth and her boyfriend made the heavy decision to call Tanner's mom and have her convince him to go back to rehab. Three months later, Tanner was dead. I've moved out of state since, but I always go back to visit Beth when I'm home. One day, after a heavy snowfall, I pulled into Beth's driveway. Just as I hopped out of my car, Beth came to the door to greet me. Something yellow popped out against the fresh snowfall, immediately catching both of our attention. We looked down and directly on her front step, perfectly placed in the untouched snow, with no footsteps around, was a nerf dart. Well played, buddy. Well played. One night, an uncle of mine was walking home. The sun was just starting to set and in Lagos at the time, there weren't many street lights. So when it got dark out, it got dark out. My uncle had been told by my abu, my dad's mom, many times not to stay out too late and to always be home before the sun goes down. My uncle was a very stubborn person when he was younger, according to my dad, and always blew off everything that my abu would say. On this night, he definitely should have listened to her, and if I'm not mistaken, he did after these events happened. As he was out walking, he saw a man standing on a street corner. The man looked at my uncle and said, You should get home, kid. It's getting late. My uncle, being the jackass he was, said, Screw you, old man. Don't tell me what to do. And went about his leisurely walk home. After a couple of blocks, my uncle saw the same man standing on a different street corner. The man said the same thing as he did before. My uncle didn't think much of it and told him to go F himself and continued walking. After a few blocks, my uncle saw the same man yet again, but this time he had a big snarling dog with him. The old man said the same thing, this time with the dog growling and baring its teeth. My uncle was a little more bothered this time, understandably so, but still told the old man to shove it and kept walking. He was nearly home at this point, the sun was gone, the moon bright in the sky. And then he sees him again, and this time he's just laughing, maniacally. Not only is he laughing, but he has two dogs now. According to my dad, 
My uncle said that the dog's and man's eyes were red, and as soon as my uncle walked past them, he heard the man let the dogs go. He took off running as fast as he possibly could, the dogs barking, snarling, and giving chase. As soon as my uncle reached my abu's house, he started pounding on the door furiously, begging her to open up. Once the door was opened, he flew inside and told her to shut it fast. My abu was trying to figure out what was happening, and my uncle told her about the man and the dogs. My abu said that he was being ridiculous and that there was nothing out there. She opened the door and saw nothing but my uncle swore that he could see the dogs pacing outside back and forth, teeth sharp, eyes red, fur black, and waiting for him. I've witnessed paranormal activity since the age of seven. I'm 26 now, and I experience this activity wherever I go. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12. I was seven. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but I'll tell some of the shorter stories now. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person, crawling on all fours with dislocated joints coming down the hallway, wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name, thinking it was me trying to scare her, but that's when she saw that I poked my head out of the day room. Her face completely lost color. She had me go into my room and dig out the Halloween mask. It was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said that the figure was wearing it and that she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit when she looked closely at him. She could see that his skin was pale and it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. My dog started to whimper and cry, and before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male's voice breathe heavily in my ear and then exhale. My dog then proceeded to freak out and bark. I could probably write a thick chapter book with all the things that I have seen, but hopefully these stories interest you. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid, and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilcara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilcara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, 
all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse. Eventually, the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night. But I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group 
creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general, but who knows. I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she'd left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantle, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantle. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, 
but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought, and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow, and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book, and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's, and one day, she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. This is a pretty tame story compared to some other things I've heard, but I think about these experiences all the time, so I thought I'd share them. My husband and I own our home. It's fairly new, built in 2006, and only one couple has lived in it before us. 
As far as I know, nothing bad has ever happened here. The first experience was when I was home alone with my children. My youngest was asleep, and my oldest was coloring at the table in the kitchen. It was the middle of the day, so the windows are open and no lights are turned on. I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, crouched down to put a pot under the bottom cabinet, when I hear the click of the light switch and the kitchen lights turn on. I turn around fully expecting my husband to be home. He isn't. Creepy, but no big deal. Months later, both of my kids are in the nursery while I'm taking laundry out of the dryer. Even though I can see into the nursery, I can't see my kids because they're playing near the bed, which is against the wall. I hear my son jumping on the bed, and I keep telling him, don't jump on the bed, be careful of your sister. I do this a few times until I get a little frustrated, and I say, don't jump, in the classic parent tone. Directly in my ear, I hear a man's voice in a loud whisper say, don't jump. I immediately dropped the clothes and ran into the room, but of course, no one was there except my kids. A week after that, I walk next to our closet to see all of my husband's hangers swaying back and forth. I never feel threatened or nervous in my home, except for when these instances happen. I tell my husband about them, and he says he sees weird things all the time, but never tells me because he doesn't want to upset me. So yeah, I kind of hate it. I am Puerto Rican and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. 
I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise, and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died, and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass, and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped, and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move, but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think... That couldn't be Papito. He's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside, but I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching was six to seven feet tall and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. 
To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So, I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city. So most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night, around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down and asked the people to help us. Somehow we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me, looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still, the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall, and I slept facing the wall. The whole night, I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days, to the point that I play a TV show in the background, and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then, something happened. One night, I'm struggling to sleep, when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. This became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, 
Who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up, and went to sleep. The next morning, I wake up for class, and he's getting ready, too. And he brings it up again. He says, your new friends are weird. They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him, and it did not look like he was joking. At this point, he was sober, too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayatul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayatul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say in my native tongue, something that means do whatever you can. I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream until the man sitting there turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long black snake-like looking things, like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room, and after asking around a bit, we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls, and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. 
No more sleep paralysis or whispers or visits or scratches or waking up in new places or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it. And to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long. Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings. So at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the serial draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud, ugly pants just drew attention to his loud, ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did, can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight, right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change, and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed, and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was, 
and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this. It appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. A family member bought this little box with a mirror inside, like a jewelry box, at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, but then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer, thought it was a great price, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out. She brought it into the home, into a room near the kitchen, and left it there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table and then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied person coming up on her. She heard something make a sound in her left ear. She said that she can't remember the exact sound but when she originally told me, it was almost like a negative, ah. It wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, somewhere in the middle. It made her jump and made her let out a loud shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave and that they were not welcome there. She said it out loud several times and in the garage and inside and outside the house. She placed a Bible on the object and held a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought somebody was trying to play a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her. But there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom, quite a distance away and another person was on a totally separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking and yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what had just happened. This all happened very quickly, around 5.40 p.m. local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, brought home, and then very strange things started happening. For example, an antique wooden clock that was purchased in another state would hang on the wall and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if somebody had moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room, but nobody messed with the clock and nobody turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name, as if somebody was calling for you, but no one actually was. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this home. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it wasn't welcome. The other experiences did not feel negative, Maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on. It's still very infrequent though, off and on. 
While writing the story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote. Things like that. And while trying to save images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with this and is just a software issue, but who knows. Update. The object has been donated to the Goodwill. She sent texts to four different people after donating it and included an image of the place that it was donated. The images disappeared or showed up blank or with a note saying that they weren't able to view it. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to what's going on here. Any insight, feedback, or comments would be greatly appreciated. After my brother died, we didn't tell my children because I wasn't ready. One of my sons, three years old, pointed at his picture and said, Oh, Uncle Matt, he's my ghost friend that goes to the woods. A few weeks before this, he made me shut his door every single night because he didn't want his ghost friends to go to the woods to sleep. Super creepy, but also creepily comforting. It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone, texting, and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight. And without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another streetlight stretch, and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off, in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, but when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash-white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car, weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, 
When it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart-opening, for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object. Same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional, though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered that I am 100% sure is haunted and maybe even malicious. A couple of years ago, I experienced a moment straight out of the Truman Show. I was skiing on Whistler Mountain with my family. I'm a fast skier, so I usually will zip down the mountain and then wait for my dad to catch up with my phone in hand in case he needs to reach me. One run, I stopped about halfway down the mountain to wait for him to catch up and received a phone call from my dad. 
When I picked up, he didn't answer. Instead, I heard what sounded like radio chatter. I couldn't make out exactly what was being said, except for one thing. We lost him. Wait, wait, he stopped by the tree. Then the line went dead and my dad came skiing down. Not only was he not on his phone, but his phone was dead. I told my family about this and even had the phone call record in my recent phone calls as evidence that I had at least received a call when I claimed I did. What was especially strange is that my younger brother had a memory of the event as well. He said that I had skied to the bottom of the mountain where he was eating lunch and that I had received the call in front of him, but I didn't. He also told me the next morning that he had a nightmare that men in suits were standing all around his bed, telling him to forget what he had seen and that, quote, he could never know the truth, he being me. He could have easily been messing with me, sure, but he seemed really shaken up at the time, like genuinely scared, and he's still fascinated by the events whenever I bring them up today. When this happened, it completely shattered my worldview about reality. I still find myself questioning what's real. It was a very strange event. I feel like I was never supposed to experience it. Like I said, it eerily reminds me of that scene in the Truman Show where his car radio is playing security radio chatter of them following him. I don't know what to make of it, but it was really, really strange. I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often liked sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom so we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features, so we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply, so we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot. So it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area. 
and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle, wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways. And everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. This is my mom's story about me when I was just two years old. My mom was sleeping with me in her bed when I woke her up. I was laughing, pointing up at the ceiling and smiling as I looked around our empty dark bedroom. I kept saying, look mommy, look, and laughing. Seeing nothing, my mom asks me what I'm pointing at. I tell her that there are beautiful fairies of many different bright colors flying around the room. But here's where it gets creepy. I point to the dark hallway and say something like, the bad ones are in the hall. That's when my mom freaked out, ran to a light switch and turned on the light. I immediately stopped laughing and pointing around the room. I guess the light made them disappear. Keep in mind that I was only a toddler and I have no recollection of this, but it's one of the stories about me that my mom tells every once in a while and I think it still freaks her out. This isn't exactly a horrifying story, so don't get too disappointed if you're not terrified. For background, I'm a 15-year-old Irish fella called Ross, I go to school in Ireland, and I'm now in third year. At the start of the second year, I knew a fella that joined the school. I was in charge of showing him around, and we've been good friends ever since. He is Portuguese, and his name is Tiago. I'll call him Tig for the story. His school bag is a fairly small, bright red bag. He's a little bit shorter than me, and his hair is quite short and brown in color. One day, I was upstairs in my school, it was break time, and I was going to my group's usual spot. I turned a corner and I saw Tig walking along the hallway. This was weird because at the distance I was from him, I would have seen him come up the stairs. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I sped up to catch up to him. There was another corner coming up. He rounded it and I followed suit, except he wasn't there. There was a staircase going back down and two bathrooms one for lads and one for lassies, but no Tig. Considering how close behind him I was, he would have had to have sprinted towards and then jumped down the stairs or jogged into one of the bathrooms. If he went for the stairs, I would have heard it, so I figured he was in the bathroom. I sat at the bench and waited. Tig was the first other person in our group to arrive. He rounded the corner and sat his bag down. The realization hit me hard. He wasn't in the bathroom, and whatever or whoever I had followed was not Tig, even though it looked just like him. Same backpack and everything. I asked him if he had already been up there, to which he replied he hadn't. He had no reason to lie. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was someone else. 
First of all, the person that I saw looked the exact same as my friend from the back. Second of all, no one else in the school has that bag. At least I've never seen anyone else with it. And third, the only place the person could have gone without sprinting down the stairs, which I probably would have caught a glimpse of anyway, would be the bathroom. No one ever came out of the bathroom. At least nobody that I didn't watch go into it. Finally, my friend is a fairly distinct character. Not many people have the same body build as he does. Like I said at the start, it's not exactly terrifying, but I do believe it to be a glitch in the Matrix. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free. And they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them, so I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister, and which ones we should give away, and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care. It was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed, and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me, and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other, and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex, and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that, they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips. As it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing.
When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments. So I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such. But many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside when there was no one there and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted. And so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts and I knew what a doppelganger was or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge and I knew that traditionally a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears over time through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so I deliberately ignored it as much as possible and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home, and I walked in still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Payson, Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Heigler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night, one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field 
and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 in the morning, and I kept hearing this rustling in the tree line, running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was just coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes, and then I heard it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view given the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. My horse Vegas and I both looked up at the same time, wondering what in the hell we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking Vegas and I, and it didn't seem so interested in the cows. In an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. Don't worry, I don't use it on animals. I only use it to make a loud noise to move the cattle along. I cracked it a few times, figured that was safer than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. I marked 38 heads, all the cows were there. So I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away and it's a bit of a trail ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard that rustling again. At this point, I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little coyote thinking that we were going to lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio. There's zero service out there, like none whatsoever. So radios are our only communication. I told him I was going to fire my gun so that he didn't get worried when he heard it. I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side and I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back only for the rustling to return five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise and they don't usually return that quickly. I didn't have a flashlight on me because I'm dumb and forgot. So I used the lame iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I had heard the rustling since I had my gun out ready for an animal to jump at me or something. I flashed my light around through the clearing in the trees. To my right, I heard rustling about a hundred feet away. I looked over and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse running across the trail. I immediately thought, oh crap, is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I got back on my horse and rode over to where I had seen it, shaking with anxiety. I looked around and was confused. I had no idea how that horse had even run into or out of the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me to start riding back, I stopped frozen in fear and got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat brimmed hat who appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out of there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. I made it back and told my grandpa. He tried to calm me down and that's when he told me that he had had some weird experiences too. So my dad used to work at this restaurant that was extremely haunted. 
The building was very old, built sometime in the mid-1800s, and there were records of at least a few deaths happening on the premises back when it used to be a boarding house. Staff used to complain about cold spots, weird smells, and sometimes something would push by them when there was no one around. But there are two first-hand accounts from my family directly. The first story is my mom's. Well, technically I was there too, but I don't remember it because I was only two years old at the time. It was my dad's turn to open up the restaurant that day, and she had gone with my father to spend some extra time with him while he did prep work. She went to the bathroom and took me with her. As she was washing her hands, she heard three knocks on the bathroom door, evenly spaced. She thought that my dad was playing a joke on her. So she whispered to me, your father has no rhythm, and knocked back in a fun pattern, a rap tap tap kind of a thing. She expected my dad to crack a joke or knock back in a playful way. But instead, the reply was three evenly spaced knocks. After she left the washroom, she saw my dad coming down from the second floor of the restaurant. Very funny, honey, she said. My dad was very confused. He had no idea what she was talking about. To this day, he says that he did not knock on the bathroom door. The restaurant was locked. You don't want customers wandering in before you're open, after all. My parents and I were the only people there. That's the first story. The second is mine. But before I tell it, I'd like to go on a brief tangent and describe the restaurant a little bit better to give you a better feel for the overall vibe. In general, the interior was always pretty dark. The only windows in the place were at the front of the building facing the street. And that natural light didn't do much because the building was very long. The back of the restaurant near the kitchens was the darkest place in the whole building, but it always felt the coziest to me. No, the worst area was, paradoxically, the brightest. There was a patio attached to the second floor with an adjoining sunroom, the worst room in the whole building. The rest of the restaurant was very cramped, very dim, very Dickensian. Good old Victorian architectural design the sunroom, in contrast, was very open, very light, and it had a lovely view of the patio and the pretty flower boxes we had out there. And I hated it. Standing in that big, empty room, you could just feel all of the space behind you, and you always had this unsettling thought that something was watching you. I used to hug the walls a little whenever I was in there, because that way nothing could stand behind me. I mention this because my story happens on the second floor. There was going to be a fundraising event on the second floor, and I got recruited to help out. My mom had me running around, putting up decorations, cleaning the works. Normally, I was scared to be on the second floor at all, but it wasn't so bad because I was with other people and I had a job to distract myself with. It was actually the first time that I had ever been up there and had fun. That didn't last long, though. The first strange thing that happened was a painting went flying off the wall. And I do mean flying. It didn't just fall. It went a good few feet horizontally. Of course, this was spooky, but we all just rationalized it, put the painting back on the wall, and kept working because people were going to start arriving in a few hours. Once the event got started, that was when the real trouble began. One of our friends, Sally, went into the second floor bathroom. When she tried to leave, the door wouldn't open, even though it wasn't locked. At this point, she got a bit nervous and knocked on the door, hoping that someone on the other side could help her get it open. And that set something off because suddenly the entire bathroom erupted into loud banging. It was a commotion. People outside heard, including me, and we all gathered around the bathroom door to try and get her out of there. We had her lock and then unlock the door. We jiggled the doorknob. We even tried forcing it open. 
Nothing worked. Inside, what was muffled banging to us sounded deafeningly loud to Sally. It really freaked her out. We were only able to get the door open once the mysterious noise had stopped. Weirdly, we had never had any issue with that door sticking before, and I don't think we had one after. Sally put on a brave face, but it was clear that she was pretty rattled. In private, she later confided that it was one of the most frightening things that had ever happened to her. Later on, after all the guests had left, I was helping clean up. We had a small stand of necklaces for sale set up on the minibar. A pendant in the middle started swaying forwards and backwards, like someone had flicked it with their finger. The rest of the necklaces were perfectly still. My mom saw this too. We both looked at each other and quietly decided that it would be best to not make a fuss and to get out of there as quickly as possible. I think that night set a record for the most unexplained events that had happened in the entire restaurant at once. It closed down a few years later, was mostly torn down, and was rebuilt. I don't know if the new building is still haunted or not. I saw a fairy portal once, and I almost went through it. I was nine years old, and it was the week before school. I was depressed about classes starting because kids had started to bully me. My mom took me on a day trip to the local preserve. When we arrived there, there was a bus load of elementary school kids, and my heart sank. I was noticeably chubby, and kids were always cruel about it. This was the 1980s, and fat phobia was intense. So we walk along the main path, full of kids. My mom could instantly charm children, so they loved her. But when she wasn't looking, the kids would say mean things to me. So I wandered off the main trail, and I found this Indian trail. It was very distinct in spite of a lot of undergrowth. It passed between two trees that arched toward one another almost like a doorway. And then I came to this huge hedge. It was too high for me to see over, and it stretched all the way from the Indian Trail to the main path, seeming to cut across the forest. The Indian Trail led right up to it, and there was a fissure, just wide enough for a child to fit through. I peeked inside, and it was so lusciously green and cool, and this was a stifling hot day, Nebraska heat, humid and oppressive. It was unusual to find some place that cool in the forest, given all the heat and humidity. I squeezed into the fissure, set my foot on the earth on the other side, and it was soft and moist and springy, unlike the hard, baked, sandy earth of the main forest. What I saw remains the most beautiful place I have ever seen. The sky was pearl blue, there was a vivid green bank sloping down to a dry creek overgrown with ferns. A huge fallen tree trunk spanned the ancient creek like a bridge. On the other side was a forest of silvery trees, the most inviting thing I've ever seen. Peaceful, wondrous. All the sounds from outside were hushed. No gabbling children, no nothing, just peace. It filled me with joy, and at that time of my life, I had precious little that made me happy. Now, I had braced my hand on the outer wall of the hedge, and my other foot firmly planted in the hard, sandy, real part of the path, because somehow I knew that if I put both feet on the ferry side, I could never go back. It was so hard not to walk into it and start exploring. I truly felt the place call to me, and I have never wanted anything so badly than to cross that tree bridge and explore the silvery forest. Even the air felt different, moist and sweet. I felt a light gentle mist touch my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in deeply. But then I thought of my mom. Could I really just leave her behind? She had had a sad life too, 
and I thought it would be a gift to show her this place and we could go in together. Well, as I had that thought, the fissure in the hedge began to close, pressing against my stomach and back. I was forced to choose, go forward or go back. I pulled myself back out of it with an effort. The hedge branches caught my t-shirt and tore a hole. Branches scraped my arm, drawing blood. I went back down the Indian trail, past the two trees entwined like a doorway, and found my mother on the main path, still talking with those brats who'd had the nerve to bully me when she wasn't looking. I insisted that she come with me to see this most glorious thing. She didn't doubt me and was willing to follow me, only now it was really difficult to find the Indian trail in the undergrowth. It was all overgrown and covered in leaves, but I spotted it and I made it as far as the two trees that were like a door. Only now they were strung with nasty cobwebs, like the trees were suddenly so old and ugly I couldn't imagine going near them, and the trail had disappeared entirely. I looked up and pointed in the direction of the hedge, sure that she could spot it from there. It was nine feet high and stretched for several yards in both directions. But no, there was nothing, only the usual trees and undergrowth. I was so shocked when it wasn't there. I saw then that it was impossible that it had ever been there. It would have been bisected by the main path, which was packed with children and teachers. I was speechless, trying to get my mother to understand what I had seen. She didn't doubt me, and she said, maybe it was just for you to see. I felt such a profound feeling of loss, like really inconsolable loss. Probably at the end of all my days, I will still think of that place. That was my chance to enter the fairy realm, but I turned back. I've never shared that story. I thought that if I ever had children, I would tell them about it, but that hasn't happened, so I thought I'd share it here. When I was around four years old, I went to my grandparents' house for my very first solo sleepover. I remember playing in their guest room and always having my attention drawn to a specific corner of the room. Anyway, that evening I went to bed soundly. I woke up right around dawn and I can remember as clear as day seeing a small humanoid figure walking across the windowsill of the window facing east. I remember the dawn light creating a sort of silhouetted image of this thing, but I could tell that it was wearing clothing. And from the waist down, it had a sort of transparent look to it. As it neared the end of the windowsill, I can remember it noticing me watching it, and it quickly hopped off the sill into the dark corner of the room that had always seemed to draw my attention. A few years ago, I was visiting my mom and I brought it up. She said that she vividly remembers picking me up that morning and I was scared out of my wits to the point where I would refuse to ever enter the same room again to gather my toys. I've run this encounter through my head more times than I can count, trying my best to dismiss it as a childhood dream. But 30 years later, that memory sticks out in my mind as clear as day. I'm pretty sure I saw some kind of fey creature. I just don't know what. Years ago, we used to babysit my baby cousins. One day, we were trying to get Vivian ready to go home, and we couldn't get her to focus on getting her coat on. She kept turning to look at the front door. Exasperated, my mom asked her why she was staring at the door. Vivian answers, I want to wave by at the man's. Why they dress like Halloween? I wave at them. And then she waved at our front door before saying, they gone now. Still creeps me out thinking about it.
This happened when I was 16. My mother used to take my phone at night and then give it back to me when she woke me up for school the following morning. Every morning started the same. She would wake me up, I would go to the bathroom to take a shower and get ready, I'd come out and put on my uniform, she'd give me breakfast, and then I would run out of the house to catch the public bus. This is the important part. I would always take my phone into the bathroom with me. I'm the type of person who plans my day by the minutes. I knew I had to take my shower for X amount of minutes, get out of the bathroom by X, leave the house at X, etc. So the same routine. I was in the bathroom and I remember it so clearly. My shower took way longer than usual. And instead of it being 7.15 when I got out, the phone said 7.23. I remember rushing out of the bathroom as I was supposed to leave the house by 7.25 on most days. I rushed and put on my uniform and my mom followed me half out of the house with my breakfast. I distinctly remember checking the clock before I left too, trying to figure out if I had time to catch the bus or if I would have to take a car to school. The clock was at 7.28 so I did have time to catch the bus. It was a snowy day in January, I also remember that vividly. The sky was gray and dark, but that's how it was every day. The streets were eerily empty. I stood at my bus stop, which was on the side of a pretty busy street. Not today. No one was on the street. Maybe one car passed by every few minutes. I started to get worried that I would be late for school. And that's when I looked down at my phone to call my dad to see if he could drop me off. It was 4.03 in the morning. I was shocked. It couldn't be. I walked back home and my mom was still up getting my other sister ready for school. She was surprised to see me. I told her to check the time and to her surprise too, it was four o'clock in the morning. She started saying how she had sworn that her alarm woke her up at seven, like it does every single morning. We both looked at each other and just swore that we'd seen the time. A 4 a.m. snowy day and a 7 a.m. snowy day looked almost identical outside but I know that I checked the clock enough times to confirm that it was in the seven o'clock hour. Regardless, we all went back to sleep and again I woke up at seven. This time I made my dad take me to school and the whole day I had my eyes on the clock. This incident never happened to me again, but I still have no explanation for it. When I was younger, I had an imaginary friend. We would color together, watch TV, dance, sing. My mother thought that it was normal for a five-year-old, so nothing more was made of it. When I was 10 years old, I walked in on my mother flipping through an old family photo album of black and white pictures from the 60s. She came across one that looked exactly like my imaginary friend. I told my mom, hey, that's the girl I play with. My mom turned white as a ghost. She tried to ignore it until she turned a couple of pages again and I pointed it out again saying, look, there she is again. My mom then told me that the little girl in the photos was her sister who had died in the bedroom that was now mine. I learned her name, her age, and so much more about her. She's still around 14 years later. I feel her presence a few times a week and she enters my dreams sometimes to talk to me. When I meditate, she will make an effort to communicate with me as well. I own some of her things from when she was alive. A watch, her library card, a hair bow, her kindergarten diploma, and a little doll. I adore her and I hope she sticks around until my end comes too. For reference, I live in Sweden and my family is very anti-religious. The house we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, 
You need room that is very clean, too, to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can only fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment when making the jars of honey. My dad had to put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll, about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he goes outside for about 10 seconds to get some air. I can see him the entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time, I was watching and I took out my phone. When he comes back in, we proceed to start again, but out of nowhere, he asks me where I put the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it's not there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start looking all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was tiny, which is why it's so odd for something to disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it's still freaking me out. Usually when my family and I experience something paranormal, we just blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained. There is seriously nowhere for that thing to have disappeared to, and that's why it's freaking me out. Even in the unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or just heard it. Moral of the story is, gnomes might still exist in Sweden. It was Christmas Eve, 2019. I had gotten into a drunken argument and I had to spend 24 hours, Christmas Day, in an empty, silent cell. I was hungover at the time and had been beaten by police for exercising in my cell. Well, after staring at the blank walls for so long, in my state of utter misery, I saw fairies. I don't believe in fairies or anything else paranormal, and yet there they were, flying around my cell. Little female figures with dragonfly wings. They never spoke, as far as I can remember. They just flew around the room and I played with them. They were semi-transparent, colorfully dressed, and I could not touch them. They were about the length of a hand, around 10 inches roughly. They had come to keep me company and keep me sane, I decided. I saw them only for a minute or so, and then they were gone. After this, I decided that they had merely been figments of a traumatized and understimulated mind, as jail cells are designed to be unpleasant, and the mind can create things in those lonely situations. I never saw them again, until this morning, exactly two years later. I awoke this Christmas morning to the exact same fairies flying around my room. I saw one clearly. She smiled and flew around me, and I remembered her like an old friend. My mother entered my room and in a haze, I told her that the fairies had come to visit again. She assumed that I was dreaming, but I was very much awake. Where I live in Southwest England, fairies are something that many people believe in and have done for centuries. After the first event, I recently visited a nearby haunted jail and I learned that one old woman escaped her cell with no plausible explanation. For the rest of her days, she swore up and down that the fairies had helped her. But to me, they are nothing more than fiction, something I never even think about. I suppose it could be some sort of trauma, as every Christmas Eve since then, I've had nightmares of running from the police like I did that night. I like to consider more rational explanations, but then, I'm starting to think that I do believe in fairies, and I hope they will visit me again, maybe next Christmas.
off, I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old, and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself, and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough. We went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in, and stupid me, I followed. Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me, and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home. So I told her I had to go. Mind you, never once asking for her name or telling her mine. But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back. And to me, she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the town home, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. My grandma is from Olancho, Honduras. In the old days, the only way to reach her area was through plane because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel by car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Remember this. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old, staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason being, we were going to drive to Florida. It was going to be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room. I had to go to the bathroom, so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door of the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see it, even though it wasn't dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity, but for some reason, there was no switch. So I turned my head toward the left, where there was a hallway toward the bathroom. I walked toward the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure, just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were just adjusting after waking up, so I walked toward the switch, but as soon as I did, the figure walked toward me. I got scared and walked faster toward the switch, and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the light, it would go away, so I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split second after I turned the lights on. 
I didn't say anything to anybody because I just knew that nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida. We all played songs and told stories, and one story that my aunt told us revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador. She said that the palm reader told her her future and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with the other woman to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother, who happened to be a voodoo priestess, and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat what the woman had told her about the curse. Quote, Your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It is a black figure with no face. It will not harm you, but it will let you know that it's there. I freaked out. I said BS and I told her to tell me she was lying. Then I told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was pretty quiet after that. A couple of years after this, my brother saw the same figure on my bed. But that's another story for another day. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed suicide after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello and what's up? We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed, and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little, and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl, and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night, though, I was having trouble falling asleep, and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep and for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared, but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm, male voice say, Marissa, it's okay. Just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me, but I told her no. I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again, 
and I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice, and when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. I'm going to assume that most people who hear this story have watched or heard of the movie Interstellar. If not, then you must know about a particular aspect of the movie before I tell you this story. There are spoilers. Throughout the movie, one of the characters has multiple paranormal experiences in her room with what she calls a ghost. This ghost is later revealed to actually be her dad, which through some very complicated events, was able to interact with certain objects and forces like gravity in her room when he's inside a black hole somewhere out in space. So a while ago, my brother and both my parents and I were watching Interstellar. I had been trying to find an open slot in everyone's schedules to watch this movie together for a long time and had finally succeeded. We watched the whole movie and at the end of it, we were all discussing how good of a moment was when Cooper found out that his daughter had figured out that he was her ghost. Just as we step out of the living room after watching the movie, we hear a noise coming from the kitchen. We locate the source of the noise and it's an old phone that we had forgotten we even had underneath a pile of old magazines. It was ringing a loud alarm and displayed a low battery message on the screen. The thing is, we hadn't charged this phone for years. At least five years had passed since we had last charged this phone, and yet it was turned on and ringing for a few minutes. We all started laughing and jokingly said it was our ghost wanting to communicate with us. Watching the movie together was such an amazing family moment, and then something like this happens? I don't know. I just found it thought-provoking enough to share. When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night. 
and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time, and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather, though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw, or thought he saw, has left him afraid of the dark and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. I've always loved the paranormal, even as a little girl. I grew up with horror movies and find the paranormal fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past that I'll probably tell about later, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience I ever had. I don't have any photos or anything because this happened when I was in the third grade in 2003, and I didn't have anything to record with or even to take pictures with at the time. Anyway, I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom and my grandmother was in the room. I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye on my bookshelf where all my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see one of the doll's dresses billowing around her and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. I should mention that my mom had rearranged them that day and had them all facing in the same direction. Skip to the next day. I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something. And I walked back in and all of my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of there screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again, but my room had always been off and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later, and this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls, and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was being watched, and that I wasn't alone, but I brushed it off as paranoia, because I never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement. Something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck. It scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night anymore. My parents divorced when I was 15 and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was a medium. I asked her if whenever she came over, she would check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped into my room, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because the family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-sized, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that that was the one she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in my room anymore. I still constantly check my bookshelf though, just to make sure everything's alright. And it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls. But still, I don't think I'll ever forget. About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument 
right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning, but both of us, being immature, decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. Well, I left a little late, and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner, so I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script, and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just gonna go get my script and a few things that I was gonna get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier? I just walked past you, like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil, dirty look, so I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating and what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil. And that's exactly what this look was. Just evil. Like even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still at the time, we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me, but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kind of like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm going to get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim. And there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. 
On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me, and I see something at the end of the trail, in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff. So he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them. And every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head, and he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second, until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, Warbringer! Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible, and I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now, by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new house. Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home, and before that, I have no idea. My partner, our young children, and I have lived here since it was built, nearly six years ago. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest child's bedroom. It was her bedroom from about six months old until about two years. She never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a crappy sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we would bring her into our room, which was directly next to her room. She would just sit and stare into the hallway outside and would refuse to be put down near the doorway and if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as her bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, a boy, now has that bedroom, and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest daughter's bedroom, she would wake in the night, and my partner would go downstairs to make her a bottle, and I would go in to comfort her. While comforting her with my back to the door, I would always feel like there was something or someone watching me, so much so that I would feel forced to glance back over my shoulder. That's the backstory. During a conversation we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest child, 15 years old, and she just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. 
he was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the two younger ones. We asked her how she slept, totally normal question and we certainly didn't lead her answer in any way. She said, eh, not so great. I felt on edge, like somebody was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, I just felt anxious. How she described her feelings was exactly how I had felt in the past when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before, so there's no way she was just regurgitating what we've said. I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. A friend recommended we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room, and we might do that. But I just wanted to share this story and see if anybody else can relate. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did 
simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second, but when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened, and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed. They were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there 
would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. I'm a 39-year-old woman, and I had a really strange dream last night. In my dream, when I turned my back, my 10-year-old self was looking at me. I was quite shocked to see her, and I asked, What are you doing here? She didn't say anything and left the room. I regretted my reaction and thought, Oh, now she would think she wasn't wanted. I had to fix it. I left the room in the hopes of finding her. And there she was, doing her homework in my grandmother's small room. When she noticed me, she smiled at me, and I felt love for her. I just remember thinking, oh, she's alone and trying so much, as always. And then I woke up. When I told the dream to my mother, she told me that I always did my homework in that room when I visited my grandmother's. Somehow, I had no recollection of it until that dream. I know dreams are dreams, but this one just felt like it had a deeper meaning, and I wanted to share. One day, I was walking by my nephew's bedroom. I thought I heard a noise, so I got a little bit closer, just to listen in and make sure everything was okay. I heard him whispering, so I stopped and opened the door a bit. I said, who are you whispering to? He said, no one. Just as I started to walk away, I heard him whisper again, but this time I heard what he was saying loud and clear. He said, shh. She's going to hear you. Totally creeped me out. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked 
scratches on the walls. No blood, though. Nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean. No scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds, even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield, I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out, as a joke, because I never really thought that anything would happen, and I love being scared. Anyway, 
I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington, jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body and somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and wendigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I wanna know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. We had a lot of paranormal activity in this old farmhouse that we lived in. Little things would happen. We would hear voices or something would turn on and we would just ignore it until one night. My husband and I were watching Stranger Things. Ironically, in the show, it was just after the lights had flicked out. Ours started to do the same thing. I made a small joke and thought nothing of it. As I went into the kitchen, I watched our vase go into the air maybe an inch and fall. Again, I thought it was creepy, but I didn't think a whole lot of it. My husband did end up getting an EVP, but unfortunately we lost it once we moved out of there. Anyway, we heard a pig on the EVP and keys. We also heard a female saying, Abby. We had a lot of other things happen in that house too. I'm not sure if it's just a ghost or if it's a demon. So far, every house I've lived in seems to have paranormal activity. My brother seems to have a lot of paranormal activity too, but he won't share what exactly has happened to him. I used to try to get recordings in his place, but he told me to stop and to stop messing with it. So out of respect, I did. I think whatever this thing is, is attached to my brother. I think that because he recently stayed with us for the weekend and I had my first paranormal experience in this new house. I had one of the doors slam with force. 
not because of air drafts or anything like that. And the stove kicked on. All of this happened right after he left. I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if something is following him around, but I'm pretty sure that something is attached to him. That or we picked something up from the farm, but honestly, I really don't know what's going on. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, 
I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. I grew up in Florida, in a house that was the original train station for the town we lived in. It was on nine acres of property that our landlord owned, with one acre of that being our neighbor that lived behind but to the left of our house. We shared a shale driveway to the left of our house, but we had a semi-circular driveway made of mulch that went around the back of the house and out to the main road. Suffice it to say that people either drove to our neighbor's house or into our driveway. No one came or went without at least passing our house. One afternoon after school, I was about 11 at the time, my dad met me at the door and said that he wanted to keep an eye out for a yellow car and that he wanted me to sit on the porch until I saw it. That day, I didn't see anything. But for about a week, he went on and on about a yellow car pulling in the shared driveway and revving the engine, and then taking off. That was his best explanation. Then, one day he yells for me to run to the bathroom window that faced that driveway. Right there was a car that wasn't so much yellow as it had a soft glow to it, even in the daylight. It was older, but I don't really know cars well enough to tell you what make or model. It just sat there, the engine revving for about 30 seconds, and then it disappeared. My dad wouldn't talk about it after that. He was out in our side yard watching it, and just like me, he didn't see a driver, just a yellow car that kept appearing and disappearing next to our house for about a month and a half total. After that, it never happened again, and to this day, I have no explanation. I was babysitting my brother's girlfriend's kid, who is three, almost four. We were eating in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, he started to have a full-on conversation with no one. I jokingly said, wow, you have a lot to say. Who are you talking to? He then just stared into the living room, which happened to be completely dark at the time. He stared for a few minutes, which made me feel pretty uneasy. It was probably a kid's active imagination, but my brother works at an old cemetery, and we always joke about what would happen if a ghost ever followed him home. Maybe that wasn't such a joke after all. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River, 
and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail, as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by, and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things, and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was, because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me, because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person, and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. 
I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, Every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was? I don't know. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, 
But I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help, which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on, in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends, so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter, and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car, and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road, and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night in complete silence in the middle of nowhere with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white. But I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends, and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone, though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there, and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter, and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area. But up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. My nephew didn't say this to me personally, but he did to my sister, repeatedly, for about a month. At the time, he was about five years old. Every single morning, he would ask my sister why the lady with blood on her tries to make him take her hand at night and come with her. He would tell her to leave him alone and cry. And she would say, shh, 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 like a mother comforting her child, all whilst holding her hand out and asking him to come with her. Freaked the hell out of all of us.
When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage and I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone, and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and I started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. It wasn't coming from upstairs though, it was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement, and I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll, and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea. But it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out, and the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream, but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. So a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. It stayed black as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up, confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in, 
The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had hurt him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So I have no idea what happened. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget, though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me, so menacingly. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. 
I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I had dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats mother nature's creatures. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. 
She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls. Basically, purchasable nightmare fuel. She had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary. So this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular living dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer, saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it. My story happened when I was nine years old. I'm 17 now, and I'm in Belgium. I shared the story with some friends, but I wanted more people to hear it. For my birthday when I was nine, I had tickets to go to Disneyland Paris with my mom. I was really happy because it was my first time there. It was really good and I had a great time. After I did the Buzz Lightyear attraction, I asked my mom if I could have one of the toys and she bought me one. I played with it sometimes and I was the kind of kid that threw his toys around and found that funny. I did that with my Buzz Lightyear, but I was careful so I wouldn't break it. My toys never had a violent impact, it's not like I had an anger problem, I just liked to throw them and see what would happen. I stopped to play with it. But the thing is that one year later, he started to make these really random sounds and shoot his laser at night for no reason. I have glasses, but on my bed I was able to see the red light and the sound was loud. The thing is that nothing was touching it, and he doesn't have any kind of detection thing on him. Nothing was touching him, so it wasn't supposed to make a sound or talk or shoot or anything. Even if I was young, I didn't believe in ghosts, but this still scared me. It was making sounds only at night when I was in bed asleep, or trying to. I was really scared, because it just never stopped. I remember asking my dad to please get it out of my room, so he put it in the basement. My basement is really small. But the really creepy thing, the really scary thing that happened, wasn't that. My house has two floors and it isn't that big. My toilet is super small and it's next to the basement door. When I was younger, I was really scared of the dark and I was holding my cat downstairs to go to the bathroom when I needed to and turn the light on because my cat brought me comfort. The scary thing that happened was it was two or three in the morning and it was really rare that I would ever wake up to go to the bathroom. My mom was often awake, but not that night. When I got down and started to walk to go to the bathroom, at the exact moment that I passed the basement door, my Buzz Lightyear doll started shooting and talking. I immediately went to the bathroom and I don't remember how much time I stayed in there. 
Even when I was in the bathroom, it was doing those noises, and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. At some moment, it was almost like the sound was getting closer and coming upstairs. I don't know if I was just hallucinating because I was really scared or if it was real. The problem is that I really don't remember how I got out of there. I really don't. I know that I probably would have just run up the stairs to get out of there as soon as I could, but I don't remember coming out of that bathroom or if the toys stopped talking and shooting, but I do remember how scared I was. It was horrible to know that I was the only one awake but at least I was okay and nothing dangerous happened to me. But it's still the worst night that I've ever had. So, the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now, he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed, near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher, and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around rotting beams and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, eminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just... pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it, just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? Let me know. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. 
seeing grisly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later, though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. 
My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming. Bear spray at the ready. That did the trick, and the bear ran off. All I could think was, just my luck. But that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps 
stopped. And then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside. So I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area, and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. 
One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house, wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field, though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend, and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry, and when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected, but this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me, though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it physically was shortly after my grandmother died and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died and it's lost as far as I know. I had always written off this phobia as some weird irrational childhood fear because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade. And I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me that made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly. I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. 
I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys. So sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern, so reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over and went to my room. Hours later and my mom actually shows up and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. 
he told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter, and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember which now makes me want to share the story because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they're often very delicate and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill store and she begged for one. I let her buy it since she takes good care of her things. I quickly noticed that something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed that she was very careful about which one she picked. She treats the dolls like gold and keeps them sitting up on the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and I hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger and I'm getting used to it, but it's just freaky and it never happened until we brought that first doll home. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron, a regular, who we see almost every day, walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons, 
The other doors are either emergency exits, which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean. As a kid, maybe 11 years old, I was once in the forest looking for lost things. Then I came across a small pond, really a small pool in the forest. A woman was standing in the water. The water reached her knees. She was looking to the other direction and I couldn't see her face. She had white hair and some old looking clothes. They looked extremely old fashioned. She didn't turn to me and she didn't move at all, but I could see her breathing. I came closer and then she left the water and stood on the forest ground. As she was raising her feet from the water, I saw that her feet were backwards. I was shocked, frozen, but I freaked out and finally turned around and began to run. As I was running, I looked back and I could see her face. She was looking at me with this evil grin and an extremely pale face. I went home and told the story to my parents and of course they did not believe me. I've never forgotten this encounter and I was wondering if anybody else had any accounts of people having backwards feet. I went to this forest multiple times afterwards with my friends, never alone again, but I couldn't even find the pond, let alone the woman anymore. The closest thing I've found on the internet is the Saguapa. As soon as I saw a picture of one, it gave me chills. The woman I saw looked exactly the same, but she was extremely pale. Everything else looks the same though. I'm fairly certain that this is what I saw, but I'm also open to any other ideas. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room, at that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast, but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. 